Hello and welcome to the continuation of the Disney Era's Ranked Miniseries. I'm setting out to order Walt Disney Animation Studios movies from my least to most favorite separated by eras. So far we've covered the Golden Age, the Wartime Era, the Silver Age, and the Bronze Age, so if you missed those you might want to go check them out first. I'll have the videos linked in the description down below. This is the fifth episode of the series where we'll be covering the next section of movies known as the Renaissance Era. Let's get into it. The Renaissance era spans from 1989 to 1999 and includes films 28 to 37 from Walt Disney Animation Studios. You've likely heard the term Disney Renaissance before, and that's because it was massive. Of course, there's the classics we all associate with Disney like Snow White and Peter Pan, but for many people like myself, the Renaissance was our introduction to Disney. If you were a kid in the 90s, these movies were everything. It was a cultural reset. It was a cultural reset. It's no secret that Walt Disney Animation Studios had been greatly struggling throughout the 70s and 80s. The box office numbers were pretty sad and as a result the creativity was dull and the quality was lacking. It was clear that the studio needed a change. A massive transformative overhaul really. Back during production for The Fox and the Hound, longtime Disney animator Don Bluth left the company to start a rival studio and he took a nice chunk of animators with him. You may have heard of some of his films such as An American Tale or The Land Before Time. Blue's movies were way more successful than Disney's at the time, and it was this direct competition that helped give Disney Animation the kick in the pants they needed to breathe new life into their projects. Luckily, The Great Mouse Detective laid a lot of the groundwork for the Renaissance, and along with Oliver and company, it made a decent profit but it was the success of Who Framed Roger Rabbit that truly provided the funds needed for what Disney would do next. The studio hired some very important collaborators by the names of Howard Ashman and Alan Menken to assist them in going forward with a revitalized vision. This era includes Broadway musical style animated movies based on fairy tales and other well-known stories, and it worked tremendously. The Disney Renaissance was an extreme success and propelled the studio who invented animated movies right back to the top where they belonged. These 10 movies include some of the best works to ever come out of Disney animation, and it will be both a huge task and a great honor for me to cover this episode and share my ranking with you. Now let's start the list. Number 10. Well, this probably isn't much of a shock. I think I'm gonna have a heart attack and die from that surprise! The Rescuers Down Under is a bit of an odd duck within the Renaissance era. It was the first canonical sequel from the studio, and in a lot of ways I think it improves on the original film. The main problem is that The Little Mermaid introduced us to this fresh new age of Disney animation and really turned a new page in an exciting way, and then most of that momentum is sort of killed by revisiting something out of the Bronze Age. Like I said, I do think it's an improvement from the 1977 movie, but this feels quite out of place. Sometimes I wish it could trade release dates with The Little Mermaid, but I'm not sure the studio could have survived that. It is what it is. The concept of the Rescue Aid Society does lend itself well to continuation since Bernard and Bianca can always find more cases to help with. Thinking about it now, maybe a TV show would have worked better for them. Anyways, this time they find themselves heading to the Australian outback to help a young boy named Cody who is imprisoned by the local poacher McLeach after discovering the location of a rare golden eagle and refusing to share it. The plot is nothing special, though it's entertaining enough and more engaging than Madame Medusa's escapades. This has much more of an action-adventure feel and there's a humorous subplot woven in where Bernard keeps trying and failing to propose to Bianca. I think Frozen 2 ripped this off actually. There are heavy anti-poaching and hunting themes, but that's nothing new for Disney. It is pretty sweet to see the golden eagle, Marahoop, prevail along with her eggs thanks to our leads. Speaking of them, it's wonderful to have the returning voice performances of Bob Newhart and Eva Gabor as Bernard and Bianca. They're very likable, and despite the Aussie mouse Jake stirring up some competitive jealousy in Bernard, they're able to move to the next step in their relationship. The confident and adventurous Jake is a perfect foil for Bernard, and the insecurity Jake causes within Bernard leads him to step up and help save the day in the end. McLeach is a bit of a throwaway villain, but he serves his purpose. 
The true star and my biggest highlight of the rest here is Down Under is McLeach's pet sidekick, Joanna. She's really weird and just generally brings a lot of entertainment value to the movie. The Rescuers Down Under marks only the second film from the studio to not include any original songs. No melancholy woman tracks played over paper towel montages this time, I guess. The score is good, although not too memorable. The highlight comes during Cody's first flight with Marahoot. That's a really strong sequence. I'm a big fan of the animation in this movie. It's great to see Bernard and Bianca all sleek and smooth like this, and the Australian Outback setting is showcased more than adequately. It's honestly a little odd to see the rescuers looking so good. If anything, I'm glad this concept and these characters got the chance to look great. The Rescuers Down Under was the first movie from the studio to be animated using the new CAPS process exclusively. This allowed animators' drawings and background paintings to be scanned into the computer and then be inked and painted digitally. It also allowed for lots of options with camera positioning and movements. I don't think The Rescuers Down Under needed to exist, but I'm not mad about it other than its strange placement within the renaissance. It improved on a concept that initially deserved better, and I'm glad for that. My feelings are generally neutral towards this movie, with a leaning into the positive zone. It looks nice, the story, characters, and score are decent, and it has an awesome setting. I'm glad that the legacy of the Rescue Aid Society lives on. Number 9 It feels wrong to rank Tarzan at 9 because I really do like it, but that's just a testament to the strength of the renaissance. It's a good thing to have a movie I genuinely like this low. I'll just start where most people's minds go when they think of Tarzan. Phil Collins. He was brought on to write and perform the songs for the soundtrack so that he could serve as a narrator of sorts rather than the traditional musical method of the characters breaking into song. Apparently the directors thought it would be stupid if Tarzan sang. No matter the reason, I think most of us are glad things turned out as they did. This soundtrack, for lack of a better term, slaps. The songs do an effective job of conveying Tarzan's experiences, they sound fantastic, and Collins manages to perform the tracks while meshing with the environment of the film and not coming across as intrusive. I've heard some complain that the songs are essentially top 40 hits shoehorned into a Disney movie, and I really have to disagree with that. While the songs aren't so specific that they couldn't be enjoyed outside the context of watching Tarzan, they really do an effective job of matching and elevating the themes and tones present throughout the movie. You'll Be In My Heart is gorgeously touching with its tender melody, and Strangers Like Me, my favorite track, captures Tarzan's excitement and exhilaration at learning about the human world brilliantly. Collins worked closely with the composer of Tarzan's score, Mark Mancina, so that the songs and orchestral arrangements would ebb and flow together. I think they did a marvelous job crafting a cohesive soundtrack that complements the emotions and environments of the movie beautifully. Tarzan's plot is pretty simple, injected with themes of feeling like an outsider and finding one's place. The main reason it works is because of Tarzan's relationship with his adoptive parents. Tarzan's human parents were killed by Sabor the Leopard, as was Kerchak and Kala's son. Sabor needs to chill. Daddy, chill. With Tarzan being parentless and the gorillas being childless, it seemed like a good match. But while Kala finds comfort and a true love for Tarzan, Kerchak has always been bitter towards him, not accepting the human in place of his son. This non-acceptance from his father figure and clearly looking different from all his friends plagues Tarzan as he grows up and is what drives him to want to go with the humans when they arrive but his deep love for his mother and his home keeps him feeling torn. This internal conflict is hard to watch, but it's also what makes the movie engaging and emotionally rewarding. The scene where Tarzan dresses in human clothes for the first time and says goodbye to his mother is a big tearjerker. I can feel the lump in my throat already. No matter where I go, you will always be my mother. <laughs> and Kerchak's acceptance of Tarzan finally comes after watching him return and fight for their home. It happens on his deathbed, but better late than never. Talk about bittersweet. Then there's Tarzan's relationship with Jane. I really enjoy their dynamic. They have a rather lively first introduction, but after things calm down, the two of them are intensely curious about each other right off the bat. Jane helps Tarzan learn about the human world, and she thinks that she's helping him find where he belongs. Even Tarzan thinks that for a time, 
but it becomes evident that it's the opposite. Jane, and her father for that matter, both love not only Tarzan, but the jungle and the life it sustains. It's lovely to see them decide to stay in the end. Tarzan and Jane are both so likable and their connection is so genuine and earnest that it's hard not to root for them. Turk and Tantor are fun side companions for Tarzan, and Clayton is an okay villain. He's similar to McLeach, but I think Clayton has more substance, and I appreciate that he plays the long con and builds up a bit of a relationship with Tarzan. Villains don't always interact with their film's protagonist much, and I like when they do. In terms of animation, this movie is very strong. The whole renaissance has stellar animation. What a breath of fresh air after the Bronze Age, hey? One of my favorite elements of the animation in Tarzan is the lush and dense jungle backgrounds. Paired with the score, the movie does a masterful job of cultivating an encompassing atmosphere for the story to unfold in. My other favorite part of the animation is Tarzan's movements when he's swinging on vines and surfing the tree branches of the jungle. Animators studied and took inspiration from skateboarders for some of these sequences. Overall, Tarzan is good. I believe the main reason I don't like it as much as the other entries in this era is that it's not as complex in terms of plot, and while the animation and characters are strong, in the rest of the renaissance movies those elements are even stronger. It's tough competition out here now, I'm not used to this. But yeah, Tarzan is well done and I like it. Its soundtrack is its strongest asset and for that reason, it will always be in my heart. Number 8 Now this one reminds me a little of Disney's endeavor with the Black Cauldron, which is to say, why did they make it? The dark and mature themes scream the opposite of what you'd expect from Disney. The Black Cauldron went overboard in the scary and gruesome department. The Hunchback takes a similarly dark yet different route in terms of mature themes including elements such as lust, damnation, and genocide. The movie is of course based on the Victor Hugo novel of the same name, and I already said it but I'm really puzzled as to why Disney took on this project. It's not bad, I really like The Hunchback, but an animation studio known for making kids movies probably wasn't the best candidate to bring this particular story to the screen. Several elements from the nearly thousand paged novel had to be excluded and watered down, and the movie still comes across as significantly mature compared to the rest of the canon. There are some strong characters here. Quasimodo, who has a great design, is one of the easiest Disney protagonists to root for. He faces opposition in nearly every facet of his life, yet he's maintained a kindness and a timid charm that makes him deeply likable. Then there's Esmeralda, one of my all-time favorite Disney characters. FYI, I'm going to be referring to Esmeralda and her people as Romani in this video, since the word used to describe them in the movie is widely considered to be a racial slur. Esmeralda is absolutely striking in design and in personality. She's the first person in the movie that shows Quasimodo kindness, even if she does think he's wearing a mask. But her good character is proven when it's revealed that the winner of the Festival of Fools in fact is not wearing a mask. Esmeralda is the only one to stand up and put a stop to the cruel public humiliation Quasimodo endures. I truly admire her actions here. Phoebus is a surprisingly strong character as well. He's forced to reevaluate his duty to his job when Frollo's orders begin to clash with his morals. We see him refuse to participate in Frollo's schemes and actively oppose him, nearly at the cost of his life. As a viewer, I have a similar journey warming up to him that Esmeralda herself has. And while it's a bit adult for a Disney movie, I appreciate the more nuanced and mature dynamic of the relationship. Okay, let's talk Frollo. This guy sucks! He's gotta be the nastiest, most evil Disney villain. Chernobog, the Horned King, and Maleficent may be evil, but it's for the sake of pure evil. Frollo is evil because he has disgusting and heinous views that he uses his authority to enforce, causing targeted pain and suffering. He has a hatred for the Romani people and wants to see them eradicated. He's so wrong in the head that he can rationalize infanticide. The only reason he didn't drop baby Quasi down the well was fear of being judged by God. Thus enters the religious themes. Frollo believes himself to be a righteous man, which makes him all the more terrifying. 
His lust for Esmeralda is the bane of his existence. He believes that because she makes him horny, he's sinning in the eyes of God, but if she's willing to be with him, then he'd find a way to look past it all. Shockingly, Esmeralda wants nothing to do with this creepy, crusty man, and so Frollo condemns her to death. Not only is she Romani, but she rejected him, and for that, she deserves to be publicly burned at the stake. Go, 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 go. Alan Makin composed the most grand and epic score of his Disney career for this movie. The Bells of Notre Dame is one of the coolest, most striking openings in the canon, and it superbly sets the tone for what's to come. The songs are quite wonderful too. Out There is Quasimodo's version of the classic Princess I Want song. It conveys his longing to break free from his physical and mental prisons with a beautiful sort of desperation. God Help the Outcasts is a somberly powerful number from Esmeralda that explores the ironic hypocrisy of many Christians and highlights Esmeralda's selfless heart. The vocal performance from Heidi Mollenhauer is stunning. A Guy Like You is the gargoyle song for Quasimodo, and to be blunt, it sucks. It should have been axed. This song and the gargoyles themselves completely shatter the tone of the movie. I can see how some light humor is needed to balance out the darkness of the rest of the movie, but this song comes off as juvenile and only serves to build Quasimodo up, only for us to watch him fall. The gargoyles do serve as a way for us to know what Quasimodo is thinking and feeling since he talks to them, and I can live with that. But the song can go. And I can't talk about Hunchback songs without mentioning Hellfire. One of the weirdest, grandest, most chilling Disney villain songs. Destroy Esmeralda and let her taste the fires of hell. That pretty much sums up the sentiment. It's kind of funny how pathetic Frollo is, but Mans knows how to let his feelings out. The Hunchback is no exception to the high quality animation of the Renaissance. Although I think the style used in the 90s isn't nearly as striking or stylized as that of the 50s, so I don't always notice it as much. I'm a sucker for the traditional animation done completely by hand, but of course with advancing technologies, a lot of the animation in the 90s was veering digital. I will say the shots of Notre Dame itself are especially impressive. There are so many intricacies within the design of the architecture in this movie. And some of these shots are just wow. All in all, The Hunchback of Notre Dame is an odd entry in the canon, but that doesn't stop it from being a strong movie. Its strikingly dark themes and music make it memorable, and its intense plot following nuanced characters keeps it engaging. It doesn't have as high of a rewatchability factor as other Renaissance films, but I do find a special appreciation for it every time I revisit and hear the bells of Notre Dame. Number 7 If I were ever to have a Disney hot take, this would probably be it. I'm not calling Beauty and the Beast bad whatsoever. In fact, this is a wonderful film that is expertly executed. It's a work of art. It's just not as appealing to me as the rest of the movies in the Renaissance. I don't even consider it a hot take since I'm not negating the quality of the movie. It's really just more of an uncommon opinion in relation to the countless Disney rankings I see Beauty and the Beast clean up on. First and foremost, I love that this is a princess fairy tale musical. This is Disney's bread and butter, and it's so good to see them thrive in this format. But unlike Snow White and Cinderella, Beauty and the Beast is a musical done in the Broadway style. Howard Ashman and Alan Makin crafted an exquisite soundtrack of songs and score that weave effortlessly into the film and help propel the story and character arcs. Belle is a memorably effective track that introduces us to our heroine, even if it is essentially an I'm not like other girls anthem. The other highlights are the lyrically delicious spectacle Be Our Guest along with the stunning title track. Performed by Angela Lansbury, Beauty and the Beast captures the sentiment and the heart of this movie's romance to a T, and the ballroom setting is glorious. It's my favorite sequence in the entire film. And this movie has an incredible score. Right from the get-go, Alan Menken impresses with the eerie and sparkling prologue. There are fantastic musical themes throughout the duration of the movie, but the very best segment comes near the end with the appropriately titled Transformation. This may be the most melancholically gorgeous piece of music in a Disney movie. 
Beauty and the Beast has some fairly strong characters. Belle is a great protagonist who's willing to give the benefit of the doubt and she values heart over appearances. She's also quite intelligent, and though it may get on my nerves when she's deemed to be the best Disney princess simply because she reads, I can't argue that it's a nice quality to possess. Let's be real though, this movie is really about Beast. It's his curse and it's his growth that's needed to overcome his obstacles. The premise of how he came to be cursed is a little stupid, but it's not worth getting stuck on. Same thing with the multitude of plot holes and timeline issues. You can't focus on that stuff if you want to enjoy this movie. Beast has a terrible personality and the Enchantress essentially matches his outer appearance to his cruel attitude. And the only way to break the curse is if he learns to love and be loved in return. His nasty personality was already a huge turnoff, so if he looks like a beast, he's gonna have to shine up that personality big time to compensate. Beast's problem when he initially meets Belle is that he continues to act terribly towards her, and when she doesn't respond well, he blames it all on looking like a beast. I'm sure his appearance is unsettling to Belle, but that was never her biggest issue with him. As they spend more time together, Belle certainly brings out the better side of Beast and they forge a genuine connection that fortunately works. Otherwise, the whole movie falls apart. A gripe I have with the story is the weird insistence Belle puts on keeping her word. It's already dumb that Beast feels the need to keep Maurice prisoner after he attempts to seek shelter from the cold, but after Belle agrees to take his place, there's really nothing stopping her from running the hell away. Oh, except her word, apparently. But wait, maybe it's not that important. Because after she deliberately breaks the one rule be set by venturing into the West Wing, Belle does run away. Promise or no promise, I can't stay here another minute. Only to get attacked by wolves and need to be rescued. Embarrassing. I will admit it was noble of her to bring him back to the castle and not ditch at that point. Good job, Belle. The objects come to life make for a great cast of characters. Lumiere, Cogsworth, and Mrs. Potts are all great additions to this cast with distinct personalities and a fun dynamic. The Enchanted Castle and its inhabitants really make animation the perfect medium to bring this fairy tale to life, because obviously talking teapots and candelabras don't exist. What? Gaston is a more unique Disney villain, seeing as he's just a guy from Belle's Town. He's got massive muscles and an even bigger ego, but aside from that, he's nothing too out of the ordinary. He displays some intense misogyny and an inability to accept rejection from Belle, but the townspeople actually rally around him, whether they're gassing him up in the aptly titled Gaston or following his intoxicating lead during the mob song. I appreciate the way the song showcases how dangerous mob mentality can be and how quickly truths can be bent and transformed to fit an agenda. Gaston views Beast as competition for Belle's affections, and so he uses his influence to turn the townspeople into a dangerous weapon against him. The animation is nothing short of spectacular here. There are lots of phenomenal character designs, including Beast and the object characters. It was clever to have the spout of the teapot be Mrs. Pot's nose, wasn't it? I don't know why you, someone would ever change that. I think the backgrounds are the biggest standout in Beauty and the Beast animation. Right from the opening shot, it's exquisite. Beast Castle is a marvelous setting, and I particularly enjoy spending time in the West Wing. Does anyone else think that the castle actually looked better before the curse was lifted? There's also some really cool stained glass set pieces that not only look great, but help relay exposition in an appealing way. Beauty and the Beast is widely considered to be Disney Animation's magnum opus, with the Academy Award nomination for Best Picture to back it up. I have no arguments with that, it's a well-deserved praise. But this is a personal ranking after all, and this is my honest opinion. I like Beauty and the Beast, but I just happen to enjoy the other six offerings from the Renaissance more. Beauty and the Beast is a lovely film focused on themes of love and inner beauty told through stunning characters, music, and animation. For me, it can get a little dry and sag slightly in the middle, but those things don't hurt it much in the big picture. This film is cemented as a pillar of Disney animation, and it will forever remain a beloved tale as old as time. Number 6 
I'm not really sure how to approach talking about this. Pocahontas is, in a lot of ways, a deeply problematic movie. It's not factually accurate, and it romanticizes the life of Pocahontas and her encounters with John Smith, among other things. But it's not without redeeming qualities, and just because something has problematic elements doesn't always have to mean that the whole thing is trash. There's still a lot of good and valuable stuff in Pocahontas, and I find a substantial amount of enjoyment in viewing this film. The story is not the strong point in this movie. Even after putting the divergence from real life events aside, it isn't great. The white people sail from Europe to North America, ready to exploit riches from the land and kill the native inhabitants. I think that part is accurate. But then there's John Smith. He's not like other white people. You see, he lets them live if he happens to find them hot. That's where our girl Poca lucks out. Pocahontas ends up teaching John about her people and the land, and he ends up changing his views. But it really shouldn't have taken this much for him to view native people as human beings. But I guess that's racism for ya. The worst thing Pocahontas does in terms of the plot is towards the end when it starts framing the colonizers and the Powhatan tribe as equally hateful. The white characters act consistently racist throughout the movie, but that doesn't make the movie itself racist. The colonizers are supposed to be viewed as in the wrong in these cases, but when you get to the song Savages, they really start having the native people bite back and match their level. This all leads to the big near showdown at the climax. The two sides are ready to begin attacking each other as Chief Powhatan prepares to execute John Smith when Pocahontas intervenes. She says to her father, Look around you. This is where the path of hatred has brought us. This is the path I choose, father. What will yours be? The chief considers this, then says, We have all come here with anger in our hearts, but she comes with courage and understanding from this day forward. If there is to be more killing, it will not start with me. The sentiment is all well and good. Not killing is a good thing. It just bothers me that the responsibility of it was put on the Powhatan's shoulders to take the moral high road. The two sides are suggested to both be wrong, having hate in their hearts, only that hate's origin got there in very different ways. The white people hate the natives because they just decided to. They're racist pieces of shit. The natives hate the white people because of the way they intruded their land and mistreated them. Their disdain is completely justified. These white men are dangerous. And then they're the ones that have to turn the other cheek. The cherry on top is Ratcliffe refusing to accept the truce and trying to shoot Chief Powhatan, allowing John Smith his glorious white savior moment. After all that, you might be wondering why Pocahontas is ranked 6th and not right near the bottom of this list. But like I said earlier, this flawed film is not without its redeeming qualities. For all the faults with the plot, it's a pretty entertaining movie. I never find that it drags much and I'm never bored when I watch it. There's also the whole subplot about Pocahontas' dream with the spinning arrow and her struggle in finding her path. After the arrival of the settlers, she assumes her path is John Smith. I used to have a problem with her thinking John was her path and then deciding to stay instead of going to England with him, not because I loved their relationship, but because this whole subplot felt pointless in the end. But I've since realized that Pocahontas' path wasn't being with John, but to use her connection with him to create peace and save lives. It cements her as a strong future leader for her people, and that's why she stays behind in the end. Until Pocahontas 2 undoes all of that, of course. Uh, it's not canon. We're okay. Yeah. Let's move on to what really makes Pocahontas work for me. The soundtrack and the animation. The music in Pocahontas is sublime, especially the score. Farewell is the track that closes out the movie, and it's on another level. Alan Makin reached new heights with this. If you've ever had the pleasure of viewing the World of Color show in Disney California Adventure at Disneyland Resort, this is the same music that accompanies the Pocahontas segment in the show, and it only serves to enhance my deep love for it. Chills. It's more than perfection. And the songs are so great too. Colors of the Wind is simply brilliant. It's one of Disney's best. Just Around the Riverbend is an exhilarating take on the I Want song, and despite getting a little dicey, sonically, Savages is really great. 
There's a second part to the song where different viewpoints and melodies start to layer and it's really quite satisfying. If I Never Knew You is another one that I love, even if it was cut from the final film. Truthfully, we didn't need more of Mel Gibson singing. In terms of animation, this has got to be the most gorgeously animated Disney movie since probably Sleeping Beauty. The backgrounds here are richer and more stylized than the rest of the Renaissance. The most striking thing is the movie's use of color. Animators did not shy away from gifting viewers with beautiful, highly saturated sunsets and landscapes. The most concentrated example of this comes during the colors of the wind scene. Quickly touching on the characters, Pocahontas herself is pretty cool. She's not the most charismatic, but she still has a sense of humor and a deep appreciation for her people and nature. I especially love the smile. Her best friend Nakoma is awesome. These two have a chemistry that blows John Smith out of the water. Thomas has a bit of an unfortunate time, and Kokuum has an even more unfortunate time. And I'd say that Governor Ratcliffe sucks, but that is in fact the exact purpose he was meant to fulfill. I love the animal sidekicks in this movie. Miko, Flit, and Percy bring a real element of humor and charm to balance things out in a way that doesn't completely shatter the serious themes and mature subject matter. Some say it's weird these animals don't talk since the natives are so in tune with nature, but I actually think that's why they don't speak. Being so in tune with the land and its creatures means that the understanding is inherent, and so words aren't needed. And as for Grandmother Willow? Ultimately, Pocahontas is a tricky one. It was in production at the same time as The Lion King, and Pocahontas was the project the animators coveted and hoped to work on because it was priority number one for the studio. They fully expected to get another Best Picture nomination with this, and that is hilarious. <laughs> Disney really thought they were doing something here that thematically misses the mark, but in terms of the quality of the art, you can objectively tell that they poured all their effort and resources into this. Pocahontas is truly a gorgeous film to behold. So while I feel the need to tack on several disclaimers to my appreciation for it, Pocahontas is a movie that I really enjoy. It's flawed and it's marvelous, and thankfully, a movie can be both things at the same time. Number 5 In this movie, Disney explores cross-dressing and war. It's about time. Your great-granddaughter had to be a cross-dresser! The engaging action-adventure plot is beautifully rooted in Mulan's desperation to protect her father, and through her goodness and bravery, she's able to do what she feared was impossible bring honor to not only her family, but all of China. Mulan's personal arc and growth is cocooned within the larger plot involving the Huns and the war, and it makes the viewing experience feel balanced and rewarding. Mulan as a character is likable and profoundly relatable. She struggles to navigate increasing pressures from society and family, and to reconcile what those things mean contrasted with her true self. She makes mistakes and causes problems, but she also possesses a courageous tenacity that draws her to take risks and it propels her to her ultimate triumph. Her relationship with Shang is an interesting case since they first knew each other when she was posing as Ping. They come to find a respect and a camaraderie that gets temporarily shattered after Shang discovers that Ping is really a woman. But after sorting through his sexuality crisis, Shang smartens up and helps the group defeat Shan Yu. Shang may have come off as one-dimensional, but the added plot point about him wanting to impress his father and then having to take the place of his father after his death brings great depth to his character. Shan Yu is not the most impressive villain in terms of character, but he is scary. He has a strong presence and his army of Huns pose a true threat to underlie the story. How many men does it take to deliver a message? One. Mommy, I'm scared. Mushu is an extremely important character in Mulan. He has something to prove, 
and so he makes the rather dangerous choice to be the one to accompany Mulan on her journey. This really shouldn't have worked, but it did. Mushu is not one of the almighty great ancestors with deep wisdom or power to bestow upon Mulan, but what Mushu does have is resourcefulness. He helps Mulan think around problems and squeak by in a lot of close call situations. They form a trust and a friendship that is monumental in getting Mulan through and doing what she needs to do. And together, they save China. The music in Mulan is great. There are only four actual songs used during the movie, but they're all good. Two of them are amazing. I'll Make a Man Out of You is probably the most fun Disney song to sing along to. And when Mulan successfully climbs that wooden pillar, yeah, that just feels good. The other amazing song is Reflection, one of Disney's prettiest, most heartbreakingly relatable tracks. Leah Salonga's vocals are crystal clear and deliver exactly the level of emotion needed to make these lyrics hit home. I think it's one of the studio's best. Jerry Goldsmith's score here is nothing short of epic. It manages to capture the intensity and the scale of war while not forgetting the emotions that come with it. Mulan has to have the most adrenaline-inducing soundtrack of any Disney movie. It gets my blood pumping, but it also brings a twinge to my heart and a tear to my eye. Incredible work. And few things go as hard as this. The animation in the film has a lovely Chinese design influence woven into the overall style and the backgrounds. The aim was to have the backgrounds appear like Chinese paintings, which is why they have a softer look than fellow Renaissance movies. The shot when the Han army is revealed over the ridge in the snowy mountains is my favorite shot in the whole movie. Overall, Mulan ticks all the boxes. It's highly exciting, deeply emotional, and visually and sonically pleasing. There are likable characters, strong internal and external conflicts, and a climax that always affects me to my core. Between all of China bowing to Mulan and her union with her father, I'm a mess. Mulan initially failed to bring her family honor, and on her quest to protect her father, she ended up bringing more honor than imaginable. And she did it while being herself. Mulan spends the majority of the movie trying to be something she's not, and when she finally breaks free, she shines. She brings the most good when she's being authentic, and the value of her character is highlighted by her father's words. The greatest gift and honor is having you for a daughter. It's not what Mulan does, it's who she is. Both scenes contribute to make this one of the most emotionally rewarding and touching payoffs I've seen from Disney. And we can't forget the best character in this movie. Woo! Sign me up for the next war! Mulan isn't talked about quite as much as some of the other renaissance entries, but its impact is still strong, and it's widely adored. I think it's safe to say that Mulan succeeded in bringing honor to us all. Number 4 Nothing goes together like Greek mythology and gospel music. That sounds like a dig, but it's not. Hercules is a melting pot of things that shouldn't work together, and yet they meld surprisingly well. This is the first movie in my renaissance ranking to be directed by John Musker and Ron Clements, and they still have two entries yet to be ranked. They really have a knack for bringing fun and emotionally resonant stories to the screen with a vibrance all their own. This movie follows our lead, Hercules, as he desperately searches for the place he belongs. Once he narrows down where that is, he embarks on a journey in which he does whatever it takes to secure his place there. Only along the way, he forges new relationships and undergoes experiences that lead him to a different destiny. It's so fascinating how sometimes on our endeavors to attain our heart's desires, we gain entirely new priorities and goals. What matters most to us can shift and transform based on what happens in our lives, and that's exactly what happens to Herc. Hercules may generally be more liked for being fun than being respected as a quality movie, but I don't really care. I love watching it. The entertainment factor is pretty important to me in a movie. 
I've said it before, but the worst thing a movie can be for me is boring. And Hercules is chock full of action, humor, color, and pop culture references. There's a superb cast of characters in this movie. Hercules is a likable lead with a relatable internal struggle. I'm sure a lot of us have felt like an outcast or a freak and yearned for somewhere to belong. That paired with his innocently charming personality makes him so easy to root for. And then there's Megara. This woman is the GOAT. She's one of my favorite Disney characters. Few figures within Disney animation have a past as complex and an internal conflict as intricate as hers. Meg had a boyfriend who she loved so much that she sold her soul to Hades to save him. And then he left her for somebody else. Who is this guy? That's some deep pain. And then she's stuck working for Hades. I love the reveal of her ties with him and the process of watching her come to care for Hercules. The clash between her obligations and her heart is so juicy. Not to mention, she has the best personality. The dry humor and sarcasm serves as a defense mechanism for her kind heart and vulnerability beneath. I think Megara and Hercules are a fantastic couple. They have wonderful chemistry, and it's refreshing to see Megara be the one with more confidence and experience to contrast Hercules' shy and timid nature. Their relationship works so well, and it had to, because the ending of the movie hinges on it. Hercules finally proves himself a true hero when he saves her soul from the underworld. It's the thing that grants him access back to Olympus, the very thing he'd been trying to do all along. But this is where those shifted desires rise up. Hercules chooses to remain on Earth with the love of his life, and it feels somehow even more victorious than if he had entered those shiny gates. Hades is a humorous villain who is well integrated into the plot. I enjoy just how much he interacts with the main characters, and his dialogue is really amusing. His minions, Pain and Panic, are good for a chuckle as well. <laughs> Thirsty? Ah! Phil can, at times, be a hard pill to swallow, but he really grows on me. His connection with Hercules is the real deal, and he even comes to care for Megara, as does Pegasus. The animation is mostly the standard high quality that the Renaissance is known for. The character animations, however, are bolder and more striking than usual. They're noticeably sharper and more angular. In the past, Disney never strayed too far off from making their human characters appear realistic, and this is one of the first times we see them get a little experimental. There's also some major CGI in the form of the Hydra. It hasn't really aged too well, but who cares? It still looks really cool and this whole sequence is awesome. The muses do a lot of the storytelling with musical narration throughout the film. I love this decision because it's a creative and entertaining way to communicate exposition and the story beats. Not to mention, all their songs slap. They all hit. Go the Distance is fantastic, but the real showstopper, and my second favorite Disney song ever, is I Won't Say I'm In Love. Susan Egan, who does the speaking and singing for Meg, has the best voice. It's like the audible equivalent of eating sugar, if that makes any sense. And this song is so subversive for a Disney heroine. Typically our leading ladies are happy and thrilled to fall in love, and there's nothing wrong with that. But due to past trauma, Megara is extremely wary and resistant. But we get the pleasure of watching and hearing her work through her feelings and emit them to herself through this punchy, satisfying melody. And there's even a Haunted Mansion reference. The score in Hercules is another superb composition by Alan Menken. It's not as strong as some of his other works overall, but it does include one of my favorite pieces of Disney score ever in Meg's Garden. At the end of the day, Hercules is a bit of a chaotic mix of bizarre elements, and I really understand if it doesn't work for everyone, but I think its unexpected combinations are one of its greatest assets. This movie feels fun, it has big stakes, nuanced emotions, and it's highly rewatchable. It's nice to watch a movie that is entertaining without feeling empty because it's all grounded in effective storytelling and strong character arcs. Hercules is a slightly unpolished gem that certainly deserves respect and admiration. And that's the gospel truth. Number 3 
I'm fairly confident that if it were possible to pull the entire world on what their favorite animated Disney movie is, The Lion King would win soundly. Every element came together to make this one of Walt Disney Animation Studios' brightest gems when it wasn't even necessarily expected. I explained earlier that Pocahontas had been the priority and the projected triumph for Disney at the time, but The Lion King raced past it like a dark horse. The impact that this movie had and continues to have on audiences of all ages is truly special, and it's an example of how catching lightning in a bottle can't be done intentionally. The plot is perfect. It's based on the circle of life idea and is completely tied to Simba's emotionally motivated journey and the choices he makes in the face of the hardships he faces. There's a carefully curated mixture of comedy and tragedy, of vibrance and darkness, and of youth and maturity. The Lion King follows Simba through life-altering loss and his eventual transition into acceptance and responsibility. Simba is one of Disney's strongest protagonists. He goes from being ecstatic at the idea of becoming king to fleeing from it at all costs. He carries intense guilt over the death of Mufasa and leaves the life he knows in an instant, only to find that he can never escape his past by running from it. The most important lesson of Simba's life is shared with him by Rafiki, who teaches him that while the past can be painful, it's far better to learn from it than to run from it. Paired with his encounter with the spirit of Mufasa, this is what propels Simba to return to Pride Rock and take his rightful place as king. Rafiki is comical, but his importance to the story cannot be overlooked. And this parallel gets me every time. The main relationship that the movie hinges on is that of Simba and his father Mufasa. The death of Mufasa is obviously the most formative event of Simba's life, and it acts as the catalyst for the rest of the movie. Mufasa's death comes just over half an hour into the film's runtime, and the writers did a great job at making sure we felt a true investment in these characters and their relationship prior to this. It's established that Simba wants to be just like Mufasa, but gets ahead of himself in trying to measure up, getting into some deep trouble as a result. Mufasa isn't hesitant to be hard on Simba, but he's more than just his stern side. Mufasa is also shown to have a deep love for his son, and we even get to see them having fun together on multiple occasions. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine, when you're not really fine. It's this crafting of a well-rounded dynamic between father and son that causes Mufasa's death to be so impactful, and it's why Simba's internal conflict throughout the rest of the movie works. Also, James Earl Jones is really the only guy who can play this role. I can't go any longer without talking about my favorite Disney villain, Scar. This movie doesn't happen without this sinister, jealousy-ridden brother in the shadows. Scar doesn't have the brawn, but he has the brains, and he conjures up the terrible scheme to eliminate Mufasa and Simba, thus forcing his way to the throne. Scar's design for Mufasa's demise is Shakespearean. It's certainly been compared to Hamlet enough times. Scar may not seem like the evilest Disney villain when characters like Maleficent and the Horned King exist, but Scar kills his own flesh and blood. No other Disney villain does this, and it demonstrates a willingness to do absolutely anything to get what he wants. That paired with his immaculate design, charisma, and stellar voice performance delivered by Jeremy Irons is what makes him my favorite villain. The supporting cast in The Lion King is extremely strong. Timon and Pumbaa are so lovable and memorable, and they provide companionship and an escape to Simba when he needs it most. Zazu is a hoot, the hyenas are a laugh, and Nala is a wonderful partner for Simba with strong roots going back to their childhood. She pushes him when he needs it, and they make a great match. And Sarabi is that bitch. Keep that head held high, queen. The soundtrack is a key reason why The Lion King is so great. The songs are strong, diverse, and unforgettable. The circle of life both opening and closing the film is more effective than I can describe. That song in itself was a cultural reset. I Just Can't Wait to Be King and Hakuna Matata are really fun with colorful visuals to match, although they aren't personal favorites of mine. Can You Feel the Love Tonight is a classic love ballad that's helpful in providing insight as to what Simba and Nala are thinking and feeling. Elton John's contributions to this soundtrack are something else. It would not be the same movie without him. 
My favorite song from the soundtrack is Be Prepared. It's probably the least talked about track from this movie, and for that reason I think it qualifies as being underrated. The lyrics are scheming and eloquent. It's a delicious sequence within the movie. The glee and pride with which Scar reveals his deadly plot to his hyena minions could not be delivered better. This might sound weird, but sometimes when I listen to this song, my eyes start to water by the end just cause I'm so in awe of it. The way it builds is just phenomenal. What they did to this song in the remake sent embarrassment chills down my spine. It was like bad slam poetry, a complete butchering. Bro, please, bro, why are you do <laughs> This is the only score Hans Zimmer has composed for a Disney animated movie, and he didn't even want to do it initially. He ended up taking the job so he could impress his daughter, but he ended up finding a deep connection to Simba's journey as he ultimately composed one of the best scores of his incredible career. Every piece of the score is mind-blowingly good here, but there is one true standout moment, and that is King of Pride Rock. I don't really need to explain why because I think you all know. This is moving and powerful stuff. The Lion King serves up beautiful animation to bring this story to the screen. I love the way they decided to portray the lions. The character design work here is wonderful and the settings are grand, particularly Pride Rock. It feels like a place worth fighting for. I love the rest of the settings and the use of color throughout the movie as well. It's all around impressive. The Lion King is a deeply moving, humorous, and effective story about maturing, facing your past, and doing what's right. It communicates everything it sets out to so successfully. I don't have any issue agreeing that this is probably Disney's best overall work. Every element comes together perfectly to create a masterpiece. I happen to like two other renaissance movies more than this, but my respect is vast for the story of a young lion cub who faces unspeakable tragedy and finds a way to rise above it all to take his rightful place in the circle of life. Number 2 Each time I boot up this movie for a watch, within the first few seconds of hearing Arabian Nights and seeing that smoky red title screen, I feel like I've made a marvelous decision. This movie feels juicy. It feels bright and delicious and enchanting. It's another film with John Musker and Ron Clements at the helm. And what they managed to do with this Arabic folktale turned animated Broadway musical is nothing short of spectacular. One of the most prominent themes in Aladdin is the urge to pretend to be something you're not in order to achieve goals or impress others. Aladdin wishes to become Prince Ali so he can impress Princess Jasmine, but it gets increasingly difficult to keep up the facade. Not to mention, Jasmine likes him better as Aladdin anyways. Another interweaving theme is the idea of imprisonment whether it be literal or metaphorical. Aladdin and Jasmine both relate and bond over the idea of feeling trapped by circumstance, regardless of how opposite their situations may be. Sometimes you feel so... You're just... Trapped. trapped. I like this because it connects them on a foundational level and helps their relationship prevail despite all the lies, twists, and turns. Genie is literally imprisoned by the lamp and his inability to escape from being a servant to whomever happens to be his current master. Aladdin's character arc takes a detour when he revokes his promise to use his last wish to free Genie, but he finds his way back and honors his word in the end, and it's an extremely touching moment between the friends. I like how complex Aladdin's plot is in comparison to other fairy tale based films. Due to the inclusion of Genie and the Three Wishes, there are so many specific events and plot beats, and rather than becoming a muddled mess, the entire movie is elevated in excitement and stakes because of it. Aladdin is a great protagonist. It's already interesting for what is technically a Disney princess movie to primarily focus on the male lead, but Aladdin is such a scrappy underdog with a heart of gold. He's the diamond in the rough, for sure, and his resourceful skills like trickery prove to be very useful. 
never actually wished to get out of the cave. <laughs> you did that on your own. Oh. Well, I feel sheepish. It can get frustrating watching him continually try to be something he's not when the solution is to be himself. Be yourself. Shut the hell up. But that's the whole point of his arc. He has to mess up in order to learn and do better. Jasmine has the most personality we've seen from a Disney princess chronologically to this point. I like that she stands her ground and does what she can to feel free despite all her restrictions. Jeannie was a revelation for the studio. Robin Williams changed the game with his voice performance, and the inclusion of so many pop culture references and jokes directed at adults was new and surprisingly successful. Jafar is an intelligent and creepy villain. Jafar, my most trusted advisor. Bruh. It's his desire for the lamp that sets the whole story in motion. Unfortunately for him, his aspirations get away from him when he fails to recognize the burden that comes with being an all-powerful genie. I mean, he literally calls genie slave when he requests his final wish. Itty bitty living space. <laughs> The side characters like Abu and Iago round out the cast with some humor and fun, and they're good additions to the film. Now the Sultan is a likable guy, but it's difficult to swallow him urging Jasmine to follow the law the whole movie only to realize that he's the one with the power to change the law at the end. Well, am I Sultan or am I Sultan? Like come on buddy, you could have done this sooner, but then I guess we wouldn't have the film. Animation is truly the perfect medium for the story of Aladdin. The genie and his powers, the flying carpet, and the grand settings could not be pulled off even half as well in another form. And not to beat a dead horse with my distaste for the remakes, but the 2019 Aladdin movie proved this. It's so much duller and less believable. Aladdin is one of the absolute peaks of what Disney showed they can deliver through animation. Between spectacles like the Friend Like Me sequence, to dazzling settings like the Cave of Wonders and Agrabah Palace, the entire thing is a feast for the eyes. Howard Ashman, Alan Macon, and Tim Rice collaborated here to produce a flawless result. There's not a song on the Aladdin soundtrack that I don't like. Arabian Nights is my personal highlight, although the barbaric line should never have been included. That is one small thing I guess the remake improved on. See, I can be a little bit nice to the remakes. Friend Like Me and Prince Ali are probably the most fun songs Disney has put out lyrically. One Jump is a fast-paced and effective introduction to our hero Aladdin as we're dropped right into a situation and we see the way he deals with things. I do prefer the One Jump reprise though because it shows us the vulnerable and sensitive side of his character. And a whole new world? What is there even to say? This is one of Disney's most soaring and beautiful love songs, and the flying carpet sequence through the night is endlessly magical and breathtaking. Alan Macon delivers yet another incredible score for Aladdin. My favorite track is the excellent Marketplace. It's so immersive and everything about it is perfect. It's just enchanting. Aladdin is that Disney movie that has a little bit of something for everyone between the charismatic personalities, wild adventures, lively songs, and the romance. Now, pussycat. It makes so much sense for animation and it's an overall stunning visual experience. The conflicts are relatable and the plot is so entertaining. Not to mention, it's funny. I'm thrilled that we get the privilege of revisiting this excellent movie whenever we like. With Aladdin, Disney showed us a whole new world, and I'm so glad that they did. Number 1 All I can say is, buckle up, because I'm about to absolutely gush about my love for this. The Little Mermaid is not only my favorite movie of the Renaissance, it's my favorite Disney movie of all time. It's one of my favorite movies in general, even outside the Disney category. John Musker and Ron Clements directed a movie that saved Disney animation and changed the studio forever. 
Of course, things that came before it, like the Great Mouse Detective, were instrumental in the success of the Renaissance, but The Little Mermaid is really where things changed. The Little Mermaid started what would become known to the world as the beloved Disney Renaissance, and it proved that Disney was still the king when it came to animation. It marked the return of the fairy tale, and saw Ariel as the first Disney princess since Aurora in Sleeping Beauty 30 years earlier. It was also the first project that Howard Ashman and Alan Menken ever worked on for Disney. I like to view The Little Mermaid almost like the Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs of the modern age of Disney in terms of the cultural reset it caused. Its importance to the survival of Walt Disney Animation Studios cannot be overstated. The Little Mermaid and its success is directly responsible for the future thriving of the studio, and without it, we wouldn't have any of the incredible films that followed. While I do get off a bit on just how big of a deal The Little Mermaid is culturally, and I like to brag about it at all opportunities, that's not why I love it. I love it for each and every incredible individual element that makes up its whole. Let's start with the plot. It's not too simple and it's not too complicated. This is a plot that Goldilocks could get down with. Characters make choices well grounded in their established personalities that drive the plot forward and there's tons of fun to be had along the way. Ariel longs to be part of the human world, but there are two problems. One, she's a mermaid, and two, her father King Triton is vehemently against it. Triton believes that humans are dangerous, and he's only trying to protect his youngest, and let's be real, favorite daughter. But he goes way beyond tough love when he annihilates her grotto. This event is what finally pushes Ariel to go to the Sea Witch. In his desperate attempt to stop Ariel from exploring the human world, Triton ironically drives her right into it. What is this, an episode of That's So Raven? This is where I need to talk about Ariel as a character. Ariel has been roasted to a crisp for giving up her voice for a man. She's often seen as a bad role model for young girls. These takes annoy me for various reasons, but mainly because they aren't even accurate. If you think the only reason Ariel became a human was to be with Eric, I think you may have blacked out during this scene. This entire song is about Ariel's dissatisfied feelings being a mermaid and her infatuation with the human world. And this comes before she ever even lays eyes on Eric. From the very moment we're introduced to Ariel, she's on the hunt for human artifacts. I love how deep her passion is. It's one of my favorite things about her. But as we also discover, Ariel and her dad do not see eye to eye on the human issue. So Ariel keeps her collection a secret and goes about her life. What meeting Eric does is it adds fuel to the fire. It gives Ariel just one more reason to want to become human, so with that fresh in her mind, when Triton destroys her grotto it makes sense for her to snap. Going to Ursula is rash, but Ariel's had enough, not to mention she's 16 years old. Ursula uses Ariel's interest in Eric against her. It's her main tactic in manipulating Ariel to do what she wants. And you can call Ariel a dumbass for going along with Ursula's plan, but again, Ariel is young, hurt, and yearning here, so personally, I buy it. Moving on to the topic of Eric, I don't see Ariel wanting to be with him as a negative whatsoever. She longed for the human world before she even knew about him, but if she wants to be a part of the human world, she'll eventually want to actually interact with some humans and form relationships with them, and Eric is someone she can do that with. It always warms my heart to see Ariel participating in things she only ever dreamed of observing. She wanted to see humans dancing, and here she is, a human herself who is dancing. In terms of her not having a voice, I don't think it's this great metaphor for women not having agency or something. It makes it harder for Ariel and Eric to get to know each other, but I think being forced to be creative with communication made them more perceptive about each other. At the same time, it's a Disney romance. If you're looking for a nuanced, healthy relationship, I suggest you look elsewhere. Maybe I could guess. Is it, uh, Mildred? <laughs> Circling back to Ariel, another critique of her is that she doesn't undergo a character arc. 
But my counter to that is, does it matter? Does every protagonist have to change and grow for the story to be good? My opinion is that Ariel didn't need to change, internally at least. She knew what she wanted, and while her choices may not have always been the wisest, she found a way to get it and be at peace. The character who needed to change was King Triton. He held obtuse prejudices and false ideas about humans, and it was having an intensely negative effect on his relationship with Ariel. His decision to wreck her things sent her running to Ursula, and then he was left with despair and regret after he lost her. After the nearly catastrophic climax, Triton was able to observe Ariel and Eric together, and he learned a few things. He was able to see that humans weren't all the evil creatures he made them up to be in his head. Eric saved Ariel, Triton, and many others when he defeated Ursula, which, by the way, was pretty cool. Triton was also able to see the genuine love Ariel had for Eric. The change that Triton undergoes and the resulting mending of his relationship with Ariel is what the rest of the movie is based around, and that's why it works so well for me. Lindsay Ellis has a really great video covering a lot of the topics I've discussed here, and another thing she says is that The Little Mermaid is really King Triton's story. The overall story is about the conflict between Triton and Ursula, while Ariel is the viewpoint character. Ariel is almost like a pawn for Ursula to get her way with Triton. It's a power struggle. I do agree with this, but I also don't want to invalidate the ways that this is still Ariel's story. It does not happen without her feelings and desires, and her willingness to act on them. There's a million metaphors that can be drawn from either Ariel's longing to change forms or her forbidden love with Eric. Daddy, I love him! The queer reading is one of the reasons I resonate with this story so much, and why I have such an inherent urge to defend it. Ariel's journey is deeply relatable to me and I have a fierce love for her character and her story because of it. I admire her. I think she's brave, and I think she did what she had to do, like so many of us also have to in order to find some semblance of peace and happiness in this world. I want to touch on Ariel's sidekicks while I'm still on the topic of characters. Sebastian is the most prominent character of the three, and his struggle between wanting to fulfill his duty to Triton and helping Ariel achieve her dream adds some really great drama and humor to the plot. I think it's incredibly sweet the way he ends up being the number one guy she can rely on, and Flounder has been by Ariel's side through it all. He's the one who she could always be honest with, and who has supported her unconditionally. If he'd been physically able, I have no doubt he would have been right up there with Sebastian to help. And lastly, Scuttle. I love this guy. He has all the wrong information, but a heart of gold. It's thanks to him that they even realized Eric was going to marry Ursula disguised as Vanessa. Now let's talk about the music. This was our first introduction into the new Broadway style of animated musical Howard Ashman and Alan Menken brought to the table. This style brings elements like catchy songs, fun ensembles, stage spectacles, and dance sequences. I love the idea of a character bursting into song simply because words can no longer do their feelings justice. There's so much room for emotionally charged ideas to be communicated, whether they're fun or serious. There's this element of urgency that just calls for characters to sing, and that does a lot for The Little Mermaid. This couldn't not be a musical. Part of Your World is my favorite Disney song of all time. I even named my channel after some of its lyrics. It's the most beautiful and effective I Want song ever put to screen. Through Ariel telling us how much she longs to be a part of the human world, she welcomes us into her own world in the most stunning and intimate way. I think of moments like... And I'm floored. Ariel's curiosity about what a literal fire is mirrors the fire within herself the burning desire and craving for human knowledge and experience. And Jodie Benson's vocal performance here is unreal. Every inflection, every little intake of breath is so intentional and all the right emotion comes through. What her and Howard Ashman achieved on this song together is like lightning in a bottle. Under the Sea and Kiss the Girl are both incredible as well. And we can't forget Ursula's big number, Poor Unfortunate Souls. Ursula is one of the best Disney villains. She's a master manipulator, 
And this song is a masterclass in the art of manipulation. Pat Carroll did a phenomenal job bringing the sea witch to life. Alan Menken's score in The Little Mermaid is perfection to me. It was his first time scoring a movie, if you can believe it. Nothing gets me quite like the main titles when we see Atlantica for the first time. And the themes throughout are extraordinary. They're grand and intense when needed, but they're also tender and gorgeous and just beautiful in the smaller moments. And finally, the animation. More money was poured into the production of The Little Mermaid than a Disney animated project had seen in years. And because of this, it looks fantastic. The Little Mermaid was the first movie of the Renaissance, and the last to use xerography or traditional hand-painted cells. It made it the perfect transitional piece to launch the studio into their next era where they primarily use digital technologies. The animation in The Little Mermaid is a godsend after the cheaper animation used throughout the Bronze Age. And it's especially impressive when you look at the sheer amount of underwater scenes and what went into animating those. Disney literally had to outsource the creation of bubbles to a studio in China. There's over a million of them in the movie. I think the setting and the character designs are top tier in this movie. Atlantica, Ursula's Lair, and Eric's Castle are favorites of mine. I'd also like to shout out animators for their skills in capturing human emotions through physical actions. Ariel really showcased this since she can't speak for half of the movie, yet we always know exactly how she's feeling. In shots like these, her mannerisms tell us all we need to know. The way animators captured such innately human things astounds me. It's one of the coolest things about animation. The Little Mermaid is my perfect Disney movie. It's not that it's actually perfect, there are several valid critiques people have made, but due to the strengths of the film and its resonance with me, I either don't care about the flaws or I don't even register them. Every time I watch this, I'm filled with invigorating emotions. I feel happy, sad, excited, satisfied, and inspired. The Little Mermaid delivers absolutely everything to me that I could ever want in an animated Disney movie. It means the world to me, and I will forever be grateful that Ariel allowed us to become a part of her world. And that's the list. Thank you so much for joining me on this admittedly very long ranking of Walt Disney's Renaissance era. I considered trying to cut the script down more, but I've really been looking forward to this video and I wanted to get my thoughts across very thoroughly. This was one of Disney animation's absolute best times in history, and so I hope my appreciation for it came across well. I'd love to know your personal rankings for the Renaissance era. Leave a comment down below, and if you don't want to rank them all, just let me know which one is your favorite. If you enjoyed this video, consider hitting like and subscribe. And if you're interested in more Disney rankings, trivia, or video essays, head over to the Trove to check out videos like that. I've also linked playlists in the description down below. Thanks so much for hanging out, and expect the next video in this series soon. The appropriately named post-Renaissance era is up next. Disney got just a little experimental here, so it should be fun to talk about. See you next time.